I am delighted to welcome you all to the book launch of Misogyny in Psychoanalysis by Michaela Chamberlain. Here is the book in question. Um, so this event is to celebrate the launch of Misogyny in Psychoanalysis. I first became aware of this book just under a year ago on the 23rd of July, 2021, when Michaela contacted me to discuss the project. And the contract was signed the following month and the book entered production in November. As Michaela herself said, the subject matter is somewhat weighty, but I have deliberately written papers that I hope are accessible to any reader. And that she most certainly has done. The chapters pull no punches and are beautifully written to be accessible to all. The book is deliberately short because Michaela wanted, Michaela, I beg your pardon, wished to open up debate on a topic that appears to hide in plain sight. And it appears that her aim is realized. I am delighted that so many of you have joined us this evening to be a part of this debate and that so many of you have already purchased a copy. If you're yet to do so, a link will be placed in chat to buy a copy direct from our website at a 10% discount. And it is of course available from all independent bookshops and other booksellers. So I would like to thank Michaela for entrusting her exceptional debut book to us. It's been most enjoyable working with you, Michaela, and we at Phoenix are very pleased and proud to be your publisher. So on to tonight. The first speaker is Anushka Gross. Anushka is a writer and psychoanalyst based in Southeast London. She's a member of the Centre for Freudian Analysis and Research and the College of Psychoanalysts. Following Anushka, we have Gina Heathcote, Professor of Gender Studies and International Law at SOAS School of Law, Gender and Media at the University of London. To complete the trio, we have the author, Michaela Chamberlain, trained at the Bowlby Centre and the Psychoanalytic Unit at UCL. She's the former CEO of the Bowlby Centre, and she works in private practice as a psychoanalytic psychotherapist and as a supervisor and training therapist. So, I wish you all a very pleasant evening. I hope that that is it for our technological problems. And I shall now hand you over to Anushka Grace. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Um, thank you, Kate. And thank you to Michaela for writing that amazing book, which I Ah, sorry, I am unmuted, so I'm getting a sign on my screen. But, um, tell me if anything's funny. But um, yeah, thank you for writing such a brilliant book. I read it literally convulsively in one or two sittings. I couldn't stop. Um, it's so necessary, so beautifully put together, so accessible. It's just, it's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, I was super happy to have been invited to have any part in its launch. Um, and I was just, I mean, I suppose there were so many angles of approach to talk about misogyny and psychoanalysis. It was rich pickings, but um, so I just thought I'd go with something a bit personal, my own um, sort of experiences of something. So it's to do with the times I've terminated work to, um, to, in relation to kind of dramatic things that were happening uh, in the sessions. So both times with male patients and they were very unsettling, well, certainly for me and I'm sure also for them. Um, both things that happened a long time ago, maybe around 15 years ago uh, when I was sort of at the end of my training. Um, and I guess I started to rethink them late in 2017, thanks to my kid who was um, 17 at the time, who asked me if I'd ever um, experienced harassment in my work. And so we spoke a little bit and, you know, that, that was exactly when the hashtag me too thing was kicking off and um, and suddenly it became a question for them. And my kids always, you know, grown up with me practicing in the consulting room in the house and it's been sort of aware of my practice in that way. And um, so we spoke a bit about what might be considered harassment in the light of some of those me too stories and also um, but bringing in the idea that things aren't that straightforward, I guess, in psychoanalytic practice. So you might have someone telling you about their sexual or violent fantasies about you, and you might consider that part of the work. But my my kid was just shocked, just couldn't believe, um, you know, the, the sort of nature of the things I might sometimes have to hear. Um, and obviously there's the fact that I'm their mum, and that whole idea is a bit dreadful to them for all sorts of reasons. But, but I was, in interested in their shock um, and it made me rethink maybe some of the things that had gone on in my practice earlier and made me wonder what I might have done or thought differently. So there, there were two cases, there was one, the first one, a man who would repeatedly say that he was going to kill himself and he said if he was going to 
go down then he wanted to take a woman with him and it was this kind of big plan that he was going to hire a really fantastic car and he was going to commit suicide and he was going to kill a woman and and obviously you know so I'm at the end of my training I'm in supervision with a male analyst who's not reacting very much he doesn't think it's serious but this guy's got all this other stuff he's trying to do basically to try and stop me being a psychoanalyst sort of saying well the analytic work you're trying to do with me isn't what's helping me and here is how you could actually help me and it it was like answering the phone to him at three in the morning and letting him use my shower and, and all these other kind of completely insane things. Um, and in the end, I terminated the work with a letter to him sort of laying out why it just was not going to be possible. And psychoanalysis, especially private psychoanalysis with a woman, was not uh, a treatment I would recommend to him. And he was furious, furious, furious. Um, and then there was another man who would speak all the time about organising to have me uh, gang raped um, and he had all this paranoia about me calling the police and it would be this whole kind of drama about um, I know you're going to call the police but it's only a fantasy but it's not just a fantasy you think I'm just talking crap but I'm really going to do it and then he worked out who my kid was and they, they were I think six years old at the time and he knew who the that I don't know, all, all this stuff where they went to school, was sending me texts, brought a hammer to a session um, and was going to smash my house up, was going to harm my kid, all, all this stuff. Um, and so I ended that work with the letter marked private and confidential sent to the guy. Um, and then he tried to launch a kind of official complaint through my organisation. And the organisation entertained it perfectly except that it was done through a third party and so they said sorry we can't actually try your complaint unless you make it yourself but we will look into our policy around endings um so so it was a sort of totally unsympathetic to me response from my organization i didn't feel protected or anything it was just like well she probably did make a mistake but we can't take it seriously because you're not the one you know you're not following the complaint procedure correctly but um so it was very very disturbing unsettling makes you feel terrible as a practitioner but um and and then when I spoke about it later in seminars there was all I, I'd get told off by older female analysts saying well you know basically you should control your patients better and you should have done this and it was exactly the same discourse like you, you need to, you know of course men are out to rape you of course men are out to attack you and as a woman it's your job to know how to sort of make them not do that and one of them was even to make yourself this brilliant prize like to say you know as as you don't gang rape me you get to work with marvelous me your analyst <laughs> and and it was sort of yeah so to be seductive in the correct analytic way and that would be good so it, it was just while I'm sort of sympathetic to people who you know call out me too and say it's too black and white and more rulish and totally unpsychoanalytic and unsubtle and all that stuff I mean a bit of line drawing maybe can be quite helpful and you know certainly to women who found themselves in situations where we've been threatened or harassed or actually assaulted um, and also women who have the idea that, that all of that is somehow our fault so you know we know especially as analysts maybe that we have dark fantasy lives and even that we might ourselves be interested say in being the object of um, someone else's violence or aggression but obviously that doesn't mean we're responsible for the threats and attacks that come our way so how do you think about that stuff psychoanalytically in practice so you know of course I uh, was left after with, afterwards with all sorts of you know guilt and shame and all that stuff about what went on in those cases and thought I could have done a much better job but um, I guess that's to do with guilt about my own conscious and unconscious fantasies. But I also think there could have been a very, very different institutional response. Um, and so if fourth wave feminism or, you know, whatever we want to call that, uh, forces institutions, maybe even psychoanalytic ones who place themselves sort of outside all of that to, to rethink their approach to misogyny um, and the behaviours that it engenders, then, then I think that would be a very good thing. So, so the more we talk about it <laughs> psychoanalytically, the better. Um, and now I'd like to hand on to Gina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anushka, for really such a kind of moving and personal intervention. And my, uh, um, it's hard to follow. Um, so thank you also, Kate and 
Phoenix Publishing House for the opportunity to join you all today and to Makayla for the opportunity to read the book um, in advance copy and I'm still reading and reading again, which is a lovely kind of feeling with a book. And then this invitation to respond to your book and indeed launch it tonight. Uh, your book, uh, Misogyny in Psychoanalysis is a superb achievement. It's insightful, it's well-written, it's enlightening. And I think perhaps like Anushka, when I read it, although I'm not a psychoanalyst, there were all kinds of aha moments where it was like, oh, I've been in situations like this and felt this and the lack of the institutional response, I think is really very, very powerful. But it does feel odd for me to be here tonight. Uh, I feel a little bit out of my own comfort zone. Uh, which is usually uh, a space, uh, academic space, a law, law school at SOAS and amongst uh, law, law academics. So I framed my response to the book through my larger knowledge of gender studies uh, from both my time as a chair of the SOAS Centre for Gender Studies and as a former member of Feminist Review Collective. Uh, both of these are very interdisciplinary, uh, inspirational spaces that have kind of helped, I guess, shape my understanding of gender beyond uh, legal uh, kind of forums. So I hope I've got something to offer all the same. It won't be legal. Um, and I sort of wanted to speak, I guess, also as a non-expert reader to think and sort of really celebrate that despite uh, the way in which you draw upon your expertise, Makayla, the book is so accessible for those of us that are outside of that space. And I think that's one of the real uh, things to celebrate about what you've achieved. Uh, and you take us through, and it's also kind of refreshing as someone that lives in uh, an academic world where maybe some of this writing isn't always quite so accessible. Uh, the book takes us through structures and modes of psychoanalysis, the construction of the gaze, subjects and objects, psychosexual development, the internalization of misogyny in psychoanalysis, which I think was beautifully brought to the fore by uh, Anushka's stories. Um, across encounters in mental health and contemporary medical institutions as well as in academia and it's through this that you offer such a brilliant study of how psychoanalysis inserts an understanding of women drawn from men, men's experiences that then they give to women rather than women's experiences informing um, and the physicality of that act of insertion which I felt through the, your writing uh, that it wasn't just an intellectual uh, process but an, uh, there was something physical about it uh, and the kind of way that that is at odds with the preoccupation of psychoanalysis with the mind um, despite something quite embodied that occurs and I found also your drawing in of narrative the study of art uh, which is amazing part of the book performance and personal observations alongside your detailed and acute observations of psychoanalysis from within the field wholly accessible to me as a non-specialist reader and as I said produced so many of these aha moments uh, which I think is a real um, tribute to you as a writer to be able to achieve that um, so thank you for Makayla for your really wonderful work and it is work right to digest and then write these ideas into an, a readable text there's something also in this that is so powerful in naming misogyny. And I think like Anushka, this released something in me and this kind of naming of something that is already known but not spoken about. And not only by naming it, but describing this in an almost forensic way of how misogyny hides in plain sight to, to use your words. So reading as a feminist reader, I was intrigued by what your somewhat ambivalent relationship to the field of feminist psychoanalysis. Uh, which I think you both recognize and place your writing outside of. Um, uh, and in fact, maybe ambivalence the wrong word, and I guess maybe I could use your words to, to speak to it better. Uh, and this is from page four uh, of the book, uh, which I have here. You can't see on the camera, but I do. <laughs> the world of women, uh, you write, has become just that, the world of women, a split off group separated from the patriarchal norm of men. The fact that writers who challenge the role of women in psychoanalysis either self-label as feminist or are labeled as feminists re reflects that the mainstream remains non-representative of women's experience. And I wonder if this kind of ghettoization of feminist psychoanalysis, which I guess is one way of framing it, um, is something you might speak to us some more, some of my 
students or colleagues in the in the room and they know I love a dialogue so <laughs> inviting you to speak back to me and I wonder if you might speak to it specifically through this idea of the risk of naming misogyny both in terms of the space in which you operate but maybe at this moment in history where we see the retraction of women's rights uh, increasingly across different states and jurisdictions but also how you think the book interacts and sits with feminist psychoanalytic approaches because I don't think in some ways it is distinct to them, but I think it's also deeply indebted and in conversation with them. So I'd love you to talk to us about that. And I wanted to sort of then invite our readers or attendees, future readers, uh, existing readers, ongoing readers, what I regard the real triumph here in uh, your book, Misogyny on Psycho in Psychoanalysis. And that is returned to what I said before, this rendering of embodiment and its relationship to the mind, which in my novice terms might suggest is perhaps experienced as a lack or an unnecessary kind of aspect of the male subject or male identifying act actors, certainly in Western communities. And I think what your book illumina illuminates is a corresponding profound aspect of being, of the embodiment in being known and read as female or the feminine in, in Western communities, even in a space that's talking about the mind. And the book undertakes this through an account of the physicality, particularly of menstruation, uh, read, which you uh, talk about as otherwise being ignored in, in psychoanalysis. And through the performance art of Maria Bramovich and then uh, Carolee Schreeman, the female bodily experience and its relationship with the formation of subjectivity appears to be this core psychoanalytic blind spot that permits and perpetuates misogyny. So to end, I had a few more questions for you. I hope that's all right. Um, and obviously it's up to you which ones you wanna answer. Uh, so I wondered whether this is, uh, and thinking too about Anushka's stories, is this, is this the state of psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic spaces in 2022? What's changing? What's change, what changes are there? Where are the apertures for change? I wondered too what role uh, might feminist men play in dif a different kind of psychoanalysis or perhaps non-Western developments in the field, but it's particularly thinking about men. I see, I noticed one of the big changes on social media after the Roe versus Wade uh, decision was, was young men standing up uh, as feminists and speaking back to the state, which is not something I'd necessarily seen uh, before. And I wondered if there's a space here for that. And then my final question, a bit of a cheeky one, uh, is psychoanalysis without misogyny still psychoanalysis? Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk to you um, and to read the book, which is a real triumph, as I said, over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Gina, that was wonderful. Um, so now um, it's time to go to the author. Um, so Michaela, over to you. Um, hello. Thank you so much. I'm a bit blown away actually by Anushka and Gina and there's so much already that I'm thinking about from what you both just said. Um, but first I want to say thank you so much for everybody joining us this evening. I'm so encouraged that there's actually such interest in this topic. Um, again, thank you so much for, to Gina and Anushka for joining us. It is um, an absolute privilege and a pleasure to be joined by two people who have such insight and depth and warmth as well to talk about this um, and also huge thanks to Kate at Phoenix for actually supporting this book um, and being brave enough to do so um, and thanks to your team Hugh as well for navigating the tech support particularly Sophie Jo and getting through this which was I imagine a bit painful right at the beginning but thank you for that. Um, I want to say a little bit about the book and why I wrote it and then I really would love to come back to those points that Anushka and Gina have raised because they're such rich conversations to be had actually about that. Um, it was not until I entered the world of psychoanalysis that I was let in on a secret. Growing up as a girl and then becoming a woman, I was very much aware of sexism, misogyny and gender bias. But at my school and at my home, I was never told explicitly that there was anything that I could not do on the basis of my gender and that I should expect to be treated equally as a person. Entering the workplace and developing my career in mental health and learning disabilities for over 20 years, there was a professional expectation that that equality should continue. This experience was very much challenged when I started my training in psychotherapy. 
I was introduced to some of the writing of the key thinkers in psychoanalysis, and I was instantly fascinated by the world that was opening up before me. However, the more I read and the more involved I became in the world of psychoanalysis, the secret of misogyny became more apparent and more shocking. The secret I discovered is that in psychoanalysis, misogyny hides in plain sight, seemingly above and beyond the usual conventions of workplace etiquette, or even a vague awareness of sexism. Ironically, for a field that's main currency is reflection, the different treatment of women is bypassed as it's inbuilt in psychoanalysis. It's commonplace in psychoanalytic literature and in the presentation of case studies for a description of the usually female understands attractiveness to be given as a diagnosis rather than opinion, for the word feminine to be used as a synonym for submission, for psychosexual development to miss the glaringly obvious important stage of menstruation, and for a child development to still be modelled on the theory of male psychosexual development as described by Freud, and for women to still be described in terms of their loss of not having a penis, but gaining a baby, not a vagina or a vulva and for the fundamental experiences of pregnancy, birth and menopause to continue to be overlooked. Writing this book started from a simple query for me, or an expectation I carried with me to all the different trainings and conferences I attended. It was about the omission of something that I knew had had an impact on me growing up, or at the very least it had been an event, or something that had impacted on most of the other people I had met and worked with in autism services, learning disability services, mental health settings, friends, families, colleagues, and is a major milestone in stereotypical female development, namely menstruation. This was notably absent from psychoanalysis. I'd like to say at this point that when I use the terms male and female, I'm including anybody who identifies with those genders. It seemed extraordinary to me that whilst Freud and Klein were busy with the importance of micturition or urination, as it's now called, and whilst body parts, orifices and bodily fluids were central to foundational psychoanalytic texts, menstruation was not a key area of discussion or indeed an area of discussion at all. What seemed to me to be the bigger headline of passing blood didn't get much of a mention when surely there was a lot that could be interpreted about menstruation. And for anybody who's seen the opening sequences of Carrie, the film Carrie, you'll know that there is a lot to be said about menstruation and an awful lot to be interpreted, it's very obvious. But perhaps the omission of menstruation was the interpretation given by the psychoanalyst at the time. But more importantly, it's continued to be largely overlooked for all people who menstruate. This simple query about where is menstruation in psychoanalytic writing led me to ask the bigger question of why has it been omitted and grapple with the obvious that misogyny is institutionalized in psychoanalysis. Freud was upfront about this and repeatedly claimed to not fully understand women. He has already been widely criticized for his phallocentric viewpoint. And I don't wish to add to that. What I consider much more important and as described by Anushka there actually, is the legacy of this apparent lack of understanding where writing focusing on women is described as feminist psychoanalysis or is relegated to a niche, something not pertaining to everyone. An everyday example of this legacy is where terms such as Oedipus complex or something being very Oedipal are still in common usage, but are rarely qualified as to exactly what they mean. The terminology refers to Freud's theory of women needing to accept that there is a lack in them due to not having a penis and needing to resign herself to her inferior position. The relevance of this for the current context, that whilst these theories have been challenged, redescribed, updated, the terms Oedipus complex, Oedipus issues are still in current usage, but often unqualified. It's curious that it's acceptable for these terms to still be in, in, to be in current use, given the inherent explicit misogyny that they describe. Freud may feel a long time ago, but within the traditional world of British psychoanalysis, much importance is often placed on the analyst psychoanalytic heritage for instance, by whom they were analysed during their training, and in turn, by whom their analyst was analysed, often hitting the jackpot if the lineage can be traced back to one of the main analysts, such as Klein, Winnicott, Anna Freud or Sigmund Freud himself. Given that Anna Freud died in 1982, Winnicott in 1971, Klein in 1960, it's possible to have only one or two degrees of separation from these icons. And of course, on trainings, it is writings by these psychoanalysts that are seen as the foundational key texts. Often the reverence given to them can make it intimidating for students to do anything but incorporate the writing into their own personal psychoanalytic canon, thereby internalizing the misogyny often inherent in the writing. 
In my book, I detail the journey of a mother and daughter as a mother attempts to get clinical support for her daughter who is encountering certain difficulties as she moves from infancy to being a toddler and then going to school. The daughter has undiagnosed autism, but the mother is continually met with preconceived ideas about her due to her being a mother. Her concern about her daughter is dismissed as maternal anxiety, and she is repeatedly taken as the unreliable narrator of her daughter's needs, primarily because she has continued being met by clinicians' misogynistic beliefs about mothers, which have been unconsciously passed on between generations of psychoanalysts. This internalizing and passing on of misogyny, I termed the misogynistic interject. However, it's not just the unconscious misogyny that is at play. In more explicit, concrete terms, misogyny can be seen in the numbers of women in senior positions within psychoanalytic organizations. I'd like to give you just a couple of the figures around this. So the International Psychoanalytic Association, which was founded by Freud in 1910, has had 25 presidents since it was founded, all of whom were men until the first and only female president was appointed in 2017. The British Psychoanalytic Society, those are slightly higher presence of women, of the 30 appointed presidents to date, eight have been women. According to the UK Council for Psychotherapy, in a member survey in 2016, 74% of members are female, 24% are male. Of the former chairs of the UKCP since it was formed in 1989, to date shows that of the 12 chairs that have been imposed, eight have been men, four were women. The Mary Sigourney Award, honoring outstanding psychoanalytic achievement worldwide, was eponymously founded by a woman in 1989. Of the awards given to date, 91 of the recipients have been men, 22 women, and 19 organizations have received it. It is this negative hallucinating of women that has been well documented in the history of many other disciplines, even more so for the women are of color. But despite, or perhaps because of, the lack of understanding of women being documented by Freud and the reification of Freud, the negative hallucinating continues unquestioned. On most psychoanalytic training courses, the history of psychoanalysis is given in the same way as history has traditionally been taught, a male whitewash, with the exception of women such as Klein and Anna Freud, who have continued the male narrative in psychoanalysis, in Klein's case, expounding and deepening the misogyny, particularly when it came to looking at menstruation. Spurred on by the many conversations with other people who have shared their experiences of the impact that misogyny and psychoanalysis has had on them, I also wanted to write a reflection of my experience as a woman in the world of psychoanalysis and the very, sta very stages that I've gone through in that field. I should also say at this point that I'm um, very grateful to people who have actually read my book and been in contact with me to also tell me about their experiences of misogyny, which um, are very far reaching around the world and apparently even going on for a very long time. So thank you for people who've been in touch. I set out to write a short book, which is deliberately, as Kate mentioned earlier, it's not an academic tone, which argues alternative theoretical viewpoints. There are many, many extraordinarily talented theorists who've written and continue to develop these ideas. This book is about the major, minor and unrecognized trauma caused by the unconscious misogyny in psychoanalysis and questioning why this is not actively being addressed. And and to extend an invitation to you to join me in putting psychoanalysis on the couch, to be curious about why it is the way it is and where it needs to change for the benefit of not just theoretical advancement, but more importantly, for those who are seeking therapy. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Michaela. So everybody, it's now time for you to place your own questions. Um, if you could please write them in the Q&A, that would be Fantastic. Oh, there's one here already. Um, so we've got a question from Darren Ward. Um, my colleague did say we may be able to get people to place their questions directly. Um, but for now, I will read them out until I hear otherwise. Um, so Darren says, Dear Michaela, have read the book and really enjoyed it. I wonder what you what your current ponderings are on how misogyny may be affecting the trans community. Um, being um, in my position and not being a trans person myself, I wouldn't want to speak for anybody else, to be frank. Um, I think at the moment there is huge change going through, and I think that goes back to actually Gina's question about um, 
is what is changing in psychoanalysis and is this really what psychoanalysis is like in 2022? I think the questions that are being raised at the moment about gender, sexuality, the fluidity within that space actually is going to be, I hope, a huge driver for change in psychoanalysis and actually be one of the things that goes into the mix. I hope the problem with psychoanalysis, as most people testify to, is that when there are differences in psychoanalysis, it splits. And so everybody then goes into their own little echo chamber and there isn't much discussion between them. Whereas I think actually the current debates that are going on hopefully should be impacting on everybody because they're relevant for everybody. So I don't know if Anushka or Gina have something they'd like to say on that. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that was very well answered. Yeah. But the, this idea that there's masculinity and then there's otherness is the thing that's, mm. yeah, that pulls everyone in risk. Yeah. And that's the thing that seems to need to urgently to move. But yeah, how to make it move is, well, a question very well, you know, tackled in your book. But yeah, very, very difficult. Thanks, Anushka. Um, that's that's fantastic. Um, we haven't got any other questions. Oh, hang on. I think we might do in chat. Um, OK, we've got a couple in chat here. Um, OK, right. So um, from Nicholas uh, Freeland, um, dear Mikhaila, what's your view on the discourse and agenda of EDI? Do you see it as a means of putting psychoanalysis on the couch or a means of grasping the nettle of harm and trauma perpetrated in our trainings and organisations? Um, to be frank, can you clarify like, what you mean by EDI? Um, uh, if you can, Nicholas Freeland, that would be great. Yes. <laughs> Equality, diversity and inclusion training, I imagine. Okay. Um, I suppose yes, it is respect. equality, diversity and inclusion. OK, thank you. And thank you for highlighting that. I suppose there is something that is interesting about this, isn't there, as to where um, misogyny gets placed in that and whether it does get placed in that training or not and how that training takes place and actually whether the necessary discussions have taken place already for the training to be meaningful. And I suppose it is a method of putting it on the couch. Um, but I suppose my concern would be is how effectively it's put on the couch and by who. And how much um, organisations are really willing to actually um, engage with their own misogyny or not. As what I sort of describe most in the book is all the thing that I, I find most shocking is actually how defended psychoanalysis is as discipline given that the whole concept of psychoanalysis is looking at the unconscious processes, looking at defences, really challenging yourself and putting yourself under the microscope as a clinician, as well as going through you know, um, your work with patients, but also your own analysis, is that there seems to be this massive blind spot that suddenly when actually that's looked at, it's given a, a whole pulse. It doesn't need to be um, engaged with. And so in some ways, I think there's a lot of work to be done in institutions in the first place about just starting these conversations. It seems to me, and it goes back to what Anushka was talking about earlier, actually, in her experiences, is that this um, internalised misogyny and the misogynistic interject that we're all carrying, that that isn't being talked about enough or grappled with. And I think that's why you get that institutionalised trauma passed on where you can have these experiences and you're blamed for the experience. And I think I'm thankful in that my experience before going into psychotherapy, working in the NHS and social services, is that actually the organisation, I'm not saying it was perfect, but it was very different to the response you get in psychoanalysis, you know, where, I, and I've had similar experiences too, where it's kind of, you know, it's not even thought about in terms of how you might feel in terms of your safety, which should be a basic, given and the thing that struck me was following um the murder of sarah everard and and wayne cousins and the we've had the me too movement but following the murder of sarah everard there was a complete absence i think in an upsurgence of training supervisions conferences discussion groups 
about what it meant for women and for men in psychoanalysis. There wasn't any great training around actually what does it mean as a woman sat in a consulting room when you've got somebody who's just sent you an email or they phoned you and they're coming in for the first time. Like, where are the issues of safety in that? What does it mean for men being in the consulting room and having women coming in against a backdrop where I actually have some stats on this. 50% of men changed their behavior in the aftermath of Sarah Everard's murder. And yet somehow within psychoanalysis, we thought we were okay. We had that covered. But yet 50% of men were changing their attitudes. But somehow we didn't feel the need to address that in our trainings or in our conferences or thinking about it. Can I come in, Makala? Just thinking about Please. EDI training often, at least in my experience, creates uh, ways for institution to think that they're doing something. Well, you've all done the mm. training. It, it can become a tick box and not the kind of deep seated kind of institutional inquiry about uh, patterns and kind of legacies of behavior and how they repeat each other themselves. Uh, and more often becomes, well, has this percentage of the staff completed this training and therefore we don't need to think about it again. And I think that that's one of the kind of real risks of moving from what you're talking about in the book to more EDI training, which, uh, you know, has its own val value as well, but it, 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 it becomes reduced to that kind of training, I'd say. Mm. I think there was a question about menstruation, which you sort of answered before, but there was a bit of a desire in, in the kind of long ongoing chat now for a little bit more for you to come back to that. I don't know if you wanted to speak to that. I have missed that question. Uh, so the question was in the chat box and it was a little, it was more about uh, how, what, what's the nexus between menstruation, misogyny and psychoanalysis and how you draw that out in the book. Um, uh, I think you need the art projects to talk about it personally. <laughs> I think the um, nexus between misogyny and psychoanalysis and um, menstruation is that starting point of, as I said earlier, I think it's very obvious when you look at psychosexual development, there is one development, and I say in stereotypical, meaning that in Freud's time, because quite often it's kind of said, oh, well, Freud was a man of his time, etc., to explain all sorts of things. But in Freud's time, menstruation happened. But yet even that just got glossed over, that there are references to it, but it's not included in a fundamental thing such as around psychosexual development or the impact that that might have on a person as they menstruate. But it's not so much that that was omission in Freud's time, but it's that it's continued, that there is um, this lack of writing around menstruation, a lack of thinking about it and understanding what it means for that internal world to be external and for that link even in I think very sort of crass terms when you think about menstruation it's blood you know it's often conceptualized as a trauma Melanie Klein conceptualized it as trauma whether you agree with that or not and there's a lot to be said about that to be frank but even in really kind of clunky terms how is that not being looked at is beyond me to be honest but when it's relegated to being something about just women then it becomes not so important when you have a tone that's being set which is that we don't understand that much about women but that's okay and that's where they interlapped and that that sense of it which harks back to my ambivalence about feminist psychoanalysis in a way is why a need for feminist psychoanalysis it's psychoanalysis so what are we saying when we're saying that it's a feminist psychoanalysis because does that mean that the rest of it is just about men then and that's the point of these issues just get overlooked pushed to one side and it's seen as not pertaining to the rest whereas how can menstruation just be about women and I said very heavily in inverted commas just about women surely it is pertaining to all genders and all people Okay, I've got two uh, further questions for the panelists. So I've got one from Janan um, from SOAS that says, uh, thank you so much for talking about the book in such great in depth. My questions echoes with Gina's questions on third world. How would you conceptualize misogyny with race and racialization? And then um, there's a, an addition to that. And further, how can your work change and advance one's thinking around Western centrism in mainstream psychoanalysis? I think um, 
the I wrote the book as a white woman. So I was coming from a place of my experience um, and my reading as well within psychoanalysis. And I think, as we know from intersectionality, the minute actually you put in other aspects into the mix, in particular when you, it's a person of colour and a woman of colour, then obviously the implications are huge. And as I said earlier, the, the whitewashing of psychoanalysis, it has been uh, whitewashing, a male whitewashing predominantly, or women who have continued with the male narrative, or should say phallocentric narrative. But I think there is a real difficulty there that we are just about sort of waking up to. Um, and again, I have real concerns, as you highlighted, Gina, about all the trainings, um, the whether all the um, conferences and courses that have popped up as to how meaningful they are and it feels like it's a stop but we have a very 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 long way to go I don't know what other people would think about that um well that does tie in very well with a, a question from Hermione Benest who says I think for women training in psychotherapy it can be very it can be difficult to challenge suspected misogyny due to it being turned back on the trainee as something that we aren't seeing within ourselves and our own defences or are missing within the work. Do the panellists have experience of this feeling or thoughts about this what, and what feels like a very unique position? Anushka, I don't know if you want to say more about what you were talking about earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh... There's so much more to say, so I just don't want to ramble on. <laughs> but yes. It's um, really interesting. But no, absolutely to that question. Yeah. And, and I mean, I don't even know how you begin to go in. I, I was thinking of an experience I had around this stuff I was talking about before when I thought, well, my institution aren't going to help me. So probably I'm going to need to register this stuff with the police. Like, you know, so I go to the police, uh, so naive, and they come around and they say, what, your job is to sit in your house and people come in and they tell you about their, what, sexual fantasies and like your job shouldn't exist. You just shouldn't do that. I can't, the police said, like, basically, we can't help you because what you're doing you shouldn't be doing <laughs> so it was the whole thing the institution didn't know how to respond the law was like totally perplexed there was <laughs> nothing there seemed to be nothing to refer to or no one to kind of check in with about it and so yeah beginning to to have conversations where it gets sort of brought into the institution put the institutions in question all that stuff see so, yeah but it, let's see how that goes I know I've most certainly had um, examples of it. And I know um, because of my previous experience of working in mental health settings, working in secure units, I remember when I first started training, speaking to um, a senior clinician and I was thinking about where do I sit in the room? Because that had always been a big deal. It was, it was you know, you sat in a certain place that you were near to the panic button and you always sat next to the door so that you could be the first person out. If things were getting heated, you'd get out, you could call for help. And I remember saying to him, you know, also, you know, talking through the different stages of, you know, seeing my first patients, et cetera. And, and it was in the NHS setting, which so I'm saying patient. But, and I was saying, oh, yeah, so, you know, so obviously I'll sit next to the door. And he looked at me completely perplexed. I said, well, why would you do that? And I said, well, that's just what the policy has always been for the previous 15 years where I've been working is that, you know, you sit next to the door so then you can escape. And, and he just looked completely and said, oh, well, you know, well, surely, you know, that, that you wouldn't really be able to escape, would you? And, and, and then just moved on and did not even give me chance to say, yes, actually, I can tell you at least five times where I had to do that because that was the nature of my work. But just glossed over as though it was just a non-starter. It didn't even matter. It was just something that wasn't even in the realm to think about or to think about the dynamics in the room or to think about what it might mean for me or why I was even asking about my safety at that point as well, that that didn't even enter into it. And that I, I remember absolutely being <laughs> quite silenced by it because I was training and suddenly, thought, oh, what's that really stupid? What have I, have I been doing for 15 years is ridiculous. <laughs> but it's that because there's that power dynamic as you're training as well which I think is really difficult and needs to be confronted. That's brilliant. Thanks, Michaela. Um, so we've got um, 
a few more questions here. So we've got one from Joanne Carlisle. Um, it seems that psychoanalysis is struggling to examine the embedded misogyny in its theories and systems, which has huge implications as to how it can get close to being able to offer any ideas about the centrality of misogyny in society, and particularly where it sits in an examination of colonialism. What does this say about the relevance of psychoanalysis today? I think it's a really um, important question. I most certainly don't want to, um, and my book is not, most certainly not about throwing the baby out of the bathwater. I think there are um, two different things here in that psychoanalysis has, in my opinion, a lot to offer, um, generally a lot to offer. I think there is a, And so are people working in that feminism need, really thinking about quite deeply about what it means to be women. My problem is, is that it gets sidelined. Um, I think I mean that psychoanalysis is out that a lot of the core institutions might be very outdated and quite defended at it. I think what needs an analysis that has gone off and developed in lots of different ways, they talk and actually really look at their own institutions and think about what's going on. We're living in a patriarchal society. Okay, look, Michaela, we're having a few technical issues, I think. There wasn't misogyny in psychoanalysis as it's mostly in all areas, it's about, think about it and tackle it. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. You're a bit frozen again, me? but oh, here you are. <laughs> um, did you want to jump uh, in there, Anushka? I just okay. wondered about this, this sort of terrible frustration of being a psychoanalyst, that, that in a way, in psychoanalytic theory, there are brilliant ways of thinking about all sorts of stuff. And so, I mean, towards the end of Totem and Taboo, Freud gives this sort of brilliant, plausible, fantastic um, explanation of, you know, how misogyny comes into being and becomes institutionalized and structural and whatever. And so it's sort of all there in psychoanalysis. So you've got, you know, stupid stuff like penis envy, but you've got a brilliant um, explanation of, of um, why misogyny is sort of structurally important in um, uh, patriarchies <laughs> or, or whatever. Or, you know, Fanon was using psychoanalysis because all this theories around identification and othering are really brilliant mm. theories and so it's terrible even at, I don't know if people have read the Paul Preciado book um, the trans man who wrote brilliantly uh, whatever but it, you know it really said psychoanalysis is a great thing it's sort of how you, you there, there are ways of putting that theory to use that um, really help us a lot with all this stuff but it's just <laughs> there's also it's also pig-headed and paternalistic and crap and you, you sort of have to read in this really judicious critical way to get mm. in with it but you know there's a lot of brilliant stuff in there to work with absolutely that, that chimes in with a, an anonymous question we've we've had which says um the book is really exciting and important thank you the case study chapter four is a powerful example of some of the consequences of the misogyny you describe my question is more of a reflection on another consequence of misogyny in psychoanalysis in particular i'm thinking how alternative psychoanalytic theories might have been foregrounded if misogyny hadn't been a powerful discourse i'm considering here juliet mitchell's work including sibling theory as an example we only have a few minutes left so uh if you would care to answer that in just a couple of minutes, that would be wonderful. I suppose, I mean, it's, it is fascinating, isn't it, to think about how psychoanalysis might be um, if misogyny weren't in it, which I think goes back to Gina's question of, you know, is psychoanalysis without misogyny still psychoanalysis? And I absolutely think you know, as Anushka was saying, misogyny is one aspect of the structure of it. You absolutely right. You have Winnicott right at the beginning describing and talking about the fear of woman and describing misogyny and giving reasons for misogyny too. Um, I think this is one aspect of it that and misogyny is one aspect of psychoanalysis that needs to be addressed. I don't think it's the whole picture. So in some ways, yeah, we, and I think the future is about 
how it changes. And I think it will have to radically change by, as you say, and the work of people like Paul B. Preciado, who's just astounding when you actually, you know, start to break down all these divisions and you start to really engage with inclusivity. Actually, psychoanalysis is amazing when it's yeah. properly applied like that. I think even when you look at Freud, who was arguing around sexual fluidity as well and gender identity, it's how those theories have been used and abused, to be honest. And that's what I'm questioning in that it's the establishment view, which then filters down as going, well, this is mainstream. And so all the other stuff, well, they're little divisions. Whereas actually, psychoanalysis is an extremely broad church. It's like most religions in a way that people take little parts of it and then claim that that's the best bit. Whereas actually there's a lot to be gained from it. That is perfect. Thank you, Michaela. So we literally have two minutes left. So did you have any final thoughts to leave everybody with? And meanwhile, I'd like to say thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight and also for bearing with some of the technical issues we experienced. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say um, a massive thank you to everybody who's come this evening and for the questions which have been so illuminating actually and given me more to think about so I'm hugely grateful for that um, and just a massive thank you to Gina and Anushka for making this such a rewarding and enjoyable experience as well actually and just the richness of it I wish we can and I hope we do continue these conversations and thank you to Kate as well